circular motion and energy. So today we're going to combine those topics. Um, before we get into it, I want to go over two details about centripetal force. One, the centripetal force is the force acting toward the center. That's the way that we say it. But the centripetal force doesn't have to just be one force. It can be more than one force. And the centripetal force also doesn't have to be just all of one force. It can be part of a force. So what do I mean by that? Let's imagine a situation where we have two forces acting toward the center of the path. The centripetal force is all of the force acting toward the center. So if there's two forces acting toward the center, the centripetal force is both of those combined. It's the sum of those forces. Okay. Also, if we had a force where only part of it is acting toward the center, so let's say that just a component of it is acting toward the center, then only the component pointing toward the center is the centripetal force. We'll see the first case that I mentioned there today. The second case that I mentioned, we'll see that next time, or possibly the time after that. The other thing about centripetal force, let's look at that equation. Centripetal force equals mv squared over r. This equation is very useful, but it does not give you the direction. If you look at it, there is no way to get a negative out of that because mass cannot be negative, radius cannot be negative, v squared cannot be negative. So the centripetal force is, that comes out of this is always going to have a positive value. That's because this equation doesn't tell you about direction. However, you do always know the direction of a centripetal force. A centripetal force always points toward the center. So keep that in mind. This equation does not tell you about the direction, but that's okay because you always know that a centripetal force is toward the center of the circular path. All right. Let's look at a specific example, a common example. Um, let's do a roller coaster. And we'll do a roller coaster with a big hill at the beginning, and then it goes down to the ground and goes through a circular loop. The initial hill will make 60 meters high, it will start at rest, and then the loop, let's say it has a radius of 10 meters, and then the mass of the object of the roller coaster car is going to be 125 kilograms. So from there, we're going to find four things. We're going to find the speed at the top of the loop, we're going to find the centripetal acceleration of the roller coaster at the top of the loop, we're going to find the net force on the coaster at the top of the loop, and we're going to find the normal force on the coaster at the top of the loop. Okay, let's try it. Let's find the speed at the top of the loop. Well, to do that, we can just use energy conservation. We're going to assume no energy is gained or lost. There's no air resistance, no friction, no birds that you run into. Um, so it's a closed system. So EI equals EF. Let's apply EI. That's the energy at the beginning. It's just gravitational potential energy at the beginning. And that equals the energy at the end, which is kinetic energy because it's moving plus the gravitational potential energy from its height. All right, so what we get is, oh, and we can cancel out the masses. Don't forget that. So what we end up with is a nice equation. We know the initial height. Now, for the final height, the final height of the object is not 10 meters. That's the radius. If you look at the top of the loop, it's two radii above the ground. So the final height is 20 meters. Be careful with that. That's a common mistake to make. But now we have enough information that we can find the speed at the top of the loop, 28 meters per second. All right. Now let's find the centripetal acceleration at the top of the loop. Well, that's not too bad because centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. And we know V, we know R. So the centripetal acceleration is 78.4 meters per second squared. And the direction, well, the centripetal acceleration is always toward the center. If you're at the top of the loop, pointing toward the center, it's downward. All right. Let's look at the net force. Well, that's not too bad because we know the acceleration and we know the mass. So if we know the acceleration and the mass, well, the mass is 125 kilograms. The acceleration is 78.4 meters per second squared downward. And we can get the net force. Net force is 9,800 newtons downward. All right, not too bad. Let's go to the normal force. So the normal force at the top of the loop. So tricky thing, at the top of the loop, there's two forces acting. There is a normal force and there is a weight. Now I mentioned that the centripetal force is all of the force acting toward the center. 
Here there's two individual forces that are acting toward the center. The sum of those two equals the centripetal force. And here, the centripetal force, that's all the forces added together. So the centripetal force at the top of the loop is the same as the net force. So what we get is that the weight plus the normal force is equal to the net force. Okay, well, the weight we can get because weight is equal to m times g. Okay, normal force is what we're solving for, and the net force you just found. It's 9,800 newtons downward. And if you solve, you can find that the normal force is equal to 8,580 newtons, and it's negative, which means that it's downward. All right, that was a lot of steps. I suggest that, you know, as you're going through problems, go slowly. Um, you might want to look back at these um, video notes. But let's move on to the next one. Let's say we got a bucket of water, and it's that trick where you take a bucket of water and you swing it in a vertical circle so that none of the water falls out. It's upside down bucket, but water still doesn't fall out of it. And what we're going to say is that at the bottom of the loop, it's moving at 4 meters per second. The loop that it's moving in has a radius of 0 0.25 meters, and the bucket's mass is 3 kilograms. We're also going to... Um, well, we're going to find the speed of the bucket at the top of the loop, and we're going to find the tension force on the rope on the bucket um, at the top of the loop. Okay, so let's find V at the top. You can use energy conservation to do that. Um, we're going to assume this is a closed system. So if we do that, it's got kinetic energy at the beginning. At the end, it's got kinetic and potential energy. So we can put in all of our known values. The mass cancels out. And if we solve for the speed at the top, it's 2.49 meters per second. All right, um, let's find the net force at the top. So the net force at the top we can get because the net force is equal to the centripetal force in this case. So centripetal force is mv squared over r. We know m. We know the speed. We know r. The net force is 74.4 newtons, and it's got to be downward because that centripetal force is toward the center. And if you're at the top of the loop, then toward the center is downward. Now we'll find the tension force, and that's the same trick that we used in the loop. The total amount of force at the top is equal to the weight plus the tension force from the rope. There's those two forces acting toward the center. Uh, so the net force we know is 74.4 newtons downward, so it's negative. That equals the tension force plus the weight. And the weight we can get using weight equals m times g. And the tension force, then, is 45 newtons downward. All right. Um, one other thing to point out. The force that's able to change at the top is the force that's not weight. So the force that's not weight, that's kind of like an extra force that you add on. So if you wanted to know the, the smallest speed that something would need if it's in a vertical circle, so like the smallest speed that the roller coaster would need to have at the top of the loop, or the smallest speed that the bucket would need at the top, the way to do that is to say that either the tension force or the normal force is equal to zero. So to find the minimum speed at the top, you would say that the net force is equal to only the weight. Okay, keep that in mind when you're problem solving. Uh, last thing we'll look at, this is real quick, um, circular motion and work. So I'm going to draw a picture of an object traveling in a circle. The force is toward the center. Speed or the velocity is pointed perpendicular to that. Um, if we look at just like a tiny little motion along the circle, um, I'm going to draw in the displacement. The force and the displacement over a tiny little time interval, the force and the displacement are always going to be perpendicular. Force and the displacement, let me repeat that. Force and the displacement will always be perpendicular. So, think back to the work. The work that's being done, if the force and the displacement are perpendicular, the work is zero. So, for every little tiny motion around the circle, no work is done. So, no work is done by a centripetal force in circular motion.